So good afternoon, everyone. I am Arvise Washington, the Deputy Director for the Department of Navy's Office of Small Business Programs. On behalf of the Office of Small Business Programs, we thank you for joining us today. We started this webinar series in June 2020 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic as a way to continue outreach. We've continued these webinars with the goal of keeping our audience engaged, connected, and informed while providing timely and relevant insights on the topics impacting the Department of Navy's small business community and their partners. The Department of the Navy recognizes small businesses are the catalyst of innovation, and we use this platform as the way to attract new business partners. You can view previously recorded events on our website under the Outreach tab and Past Events or visit our YouTube channel. I would like to direct you to our website where you can find a wealth of information, including locating your small business professional and finding information on how to do business with the Department of Navy, including the command's long-range acquisition estimates. To stay current on upcoming events, you can register for our mailing list under the homepage of our website. To stay up to date about upcoming industry days, commands, outreach, and in general, what's happening across the Department of the Navy, I also encourage you to connect with us on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. I hope you seize the opportunity to ask questions using the Q&A feature on this platform. And I'd like to take a moment to introduce our dynamic panel from the Acquisition Integrity Office. Mr. John Arcelowitz, I apologize, sir, is an assistant counsel in the Department of Navy's Acquisition Integrity Office, where he works on, where his work focuses on acquisition fraud issues. Prior to joining the Acquisition Integrity Office, Mr. Arcelois was a corporate finance attorney, tax trade attorney, and corporate attorney with some of the larger small um, legal firms. He's also a graduate of the George Washington University Law School with honors and completed legal internships with the Department of the Labor, Office of the Solicitor, and the U.S. Marshal Service, as well as the Office of the General Counsel. He is an Air Force veteran and has served in several non-attorney roles with the Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, National Institutes of Health, and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. We also have with us Mr. Ross Phillips, who is an attorney in the Acquisition Integrity Office where he serves as an Associate Fraud Counsel. Mr. Phillips has been with the Acquisition Integrity Office working at the Washington Navy Yard since joining the Office of General Counsel in May of 2021. He's a graduate of Emory University School of Law with honors. Before joining the Office of General Counsel, Mr. Phillips worked at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency in the Suspension and Debarment Division for five years. So please join me in welcoming our dynamic panel today. Over to you, gentlemen. All right, thank you so much, Arvis, for that uh, wonderful introduction. And, and thank you also to, to Amber and Destiny who have, who have really been uh, wonderful assistants in, in helping us put together this training, giving us this opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, so I am now sharing my slides. Hopefully everybody can see them. Uh, as, as, she mentioned Ross Phillips and John Arsolowitz, and we're from the Acquisition Integrity Office, Office of General Counsel, Department of the Navy. So what are our goals for today? What are we hoping to accomplish? Um, number one, you know, we want to support uh, the Department of Navy's small business partners. Um, we know that, that you all are essential to the Don's mission to maintain, train, and equip the warfighter. Um, as Arvis just mentioned, you know, you are the the, the foundation of, of, uh, of innovation within the Department of the Navy. And we wanna support you by giving you all the information you need uh, to be 
successful contractors uh, for the Department of the Navy. Um, how are we gonna do that? We're gonna share with you information about fraud risks. Um, so, you know, John's gonna talk to you about who we are and what we do a little later, but just so you know, you know, we are sort of the belly button uh, for fraud uh, within the Navy. Uh, you know, wherever there is a fraud investigation, whether it involves, you know, NCIS, OIG, uh, audit, if there's an audit finding that indicates fraud, all of those referrals come to us. And then we maintain a database of all of the fraud investigations throughout the Department of the Navy. So we have a very good vantage point to understand, you know, what are the fraud risks out there for contractors, be it, you know, very large contractors or, or smaller businesses. Um, and, you know, our goal here today is to share that information with you. The reason we're doing that is because we want to proactively stop fraud before it occurs rather than just excluding the contractors after it occurs. So as we'll, I'll, we'll discuss a little later, we are the suspending and debarring authority for the Department of the Navy. You know, our boss is the SDO, the suspending and debarring official. We do exclude contractors who engage in fraud from doing business with the government, but we really want to get out in front of fraud and proactively stop, work with the contractors to proactively stop the front before it occurs rather than just excluding people after it occurs. We've had programs, uh, you know, for years where we go, we meet with the Department of Navy's top 100 largest contractors uh, and they present to us on their ethics and compliance programs and we discuss, you know, what we're seeing in terms of fraud risks. And now we're, we're giving you that same opportunity. We're, we're going out and talking with our small businesses to say, hey, here are the big fraud risks that we see um, for small business contractors. Um, and last but not least, we wanna make sure that you know that you can proactively engage with AIO. You know, we're proactively engaging with you here, but you can also come and talk to AIO when you know, a problem arises. Um, we see this very often with the big contractors. You know, if they are indicted or they learn there's an investigation, um, they often will come in and say, hey, we need to talk. We need to sit down with the SDO talk to him about, you know, what's going on, what we're doing to investigate it, what, you know, what we're doing to make sure this type of thing doesn't happen again. Um, and, but we less often see it with the medium sized contractors and small contractors. Often, you know, they're just sort of waiting and praying that they don't get a notice or a letter from the SDO. Um, but, you know, you have that opportunity if, if you learn that there's a, you know, something going on, there's been, you know, one of your employees is engaged in some sort of fraud, be it whether it's, you know, you know anti-competitive practices or, or uh, you know, embezzling money or what, you know, Procurement Int Integrity Act violations, whatever it may be that, that could, you know, potentially be a cause for debarment, you can come talk to us. I can't tell you that if you come talk to us, you won't get debarred or suspended it's really going to depend on the individual circumstances of the individual case. But I can tell you that the debarring official will take into consideration the fact that you were proactive and brought, you know, that brought this matter to the attention of the government. And this is in the FAR, if you look at FAR 9.406-1A2, this is where they list, you know, these are the things that the debarring official should consider in determining whether to make a debarment or whether to issue a debarment. And one of those is, whether the contractor brought the activity cited as a cause for debarment to the attention of the appropriate government agency in a timely manner. So if you come to the SDO and say, hey, we've had this problem, but here's what we're doing to fix it. You know, we're, we're being presently responsible. You know, here's how we are going to ensure that it's not going to happen again. Can't promise you you won't get debarred, but you might get debarred for less time. You might be eligible to enter an administrative agreement, which we'll, we'll talk later about what, what those are. Um, but you're putting yourself on a better footing than if we learn about it from another source and then we send you a notice. Um, it's better if you've, you've brought it to our attention directly. Now, before we get into the, the sort of meat and potatoes of our presentation, uh, a quick disclaimer. Uh, this training does not constitute legal advice. Uh, we are attorneys, but our client is the Department of the Navy. That is, we are prohibited from giving any legal advice or any legal opinions uh, to anyone other than Department of the Navy employees. Um, so, you know, and what, you know, so don't, don't say, well, oh, well, that we, you know, I went to this presentation and I got legal advice from this attorney at the Department of the Navy. He said I should do X, Y, Z. This isn't legal advice. We're just sharing information with you. What you do with it is, is up to your, 
you know, up to you. Um, but we're not telling you, hey, you need to do this. Or if you do this thing, for example, like I was just saying about, you know, we can't tell you, oh, if you do this, you won't get debarred. Um, so if you have a specific legal question about, you know, a specific legal issue or how do I develop an ethics and compliance program to address this specific fraud risk for my business? You know, you're going to have to go out and hire a private attorney, hire a consultant. You can reach out to the Office of Small Business Programs for assistance with that. You can, you know, reach out. There are groups like, you know, DII, uh, Defense Industry Initiative, that can help you locate the right people. Um, but we just, we can't give you that sort of guidance because we are, our one client is the Department of the Navy. So here's a roadmap of what we're planning to cover today. First, um, I'm gonna hand things over to John in just a minute. He's gonna talk to you about what is AIO? What's our mission? What do we do? Um, then I'm gonna jump back in and talk, give you just a little suspension and debarment 101, just the very basic high level, what is suspension and debarment? Um, what are some of the, the sort of concepts involved in suspension and debarment? Um, we're gonna move on then to small business fraud risks here, we're gonna tell you, these are the things that we see most often in terms of, of fraud referrals uh, for small businesses and things that, you know, if we were in your shoes, we would wanna be aware of and thinking about. Um, we can't cover all the, <laughs> the fraud risks, there are too many to cover, um, but these are sort of the, the high, uh, most commonly seen fraud risk issues that we see for small businesses. And then finally, we're gonna talk again at a very high level about what can you do to stop fraud? What, how should you be thinking about fraud? What are the kinds of things you can put in place to uh, mitigate your fraud risks? And hopefully we, we'd like to come back in the future and do a second presentation that gets a little more in depth into this topic. Um, but for today, we're just gonna cover it at a sort of surface level. Um, and then hopefully we'll have that opportunity to come back. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to John who's gonna talk about what is AIO and what's our mission. Well, thank you, Ross, and thank you, everybody, for attending. A lot of you probably haven't heard of our office, the Acquisition Integrity Office, commonly known as AIO. And what we are, we're the organization within the Navy. We monitor and ensure uh, the coordination of criminal, civil, administrative, and contractual remedies. And some of you probably are familiar with some of these terms, criminal and civil, maybe not so much with administrative or contractual remedies but that's why we're here today. Uh, so AIO, where are we? Well, we sit, as mentioned earlier, within the Department of the Navy Office of the General Counsel. And, and specifically, really what we are is we are the single point of contact for any acquisition or fraud matters that could impact or have some type of connection uh, with the Navy. So next slide. The AIO, we really have a number of things that we do, but there's really two primary missions. And Ross kind of talked a little bit about this and is definitely going to get more in depth later on, but that's exclusions. And what is an exclusion? Well, generally it's a suspension and debarment. It can be something else at times, but we'll get into that more in depth. And then to fight fraud, as Ross mentioned earlier, to train, engage, and develop lessons learned. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we are here today. The so next slide. So what do we do? Well, we try to deter acquisition fraud. We try to detect fraud. We try to protect the department from fraud. And if we need to, we, we take appropriate action and we try to recover any losses uh, from those fraudulent gains. Now, AIL, our, what our, our responsibilities are we coordinate with a number of different government agencies. Uh, we accept referrals, investigations. Are you on the, uh, the we, mission to slide? Slide seven. Yeah. Okay, so we'll go to the next slide, slide eight. So we're located right here in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're we centralized uh, and work with and coordinate with our government partners. And really, when you fight fraud, it's not just the Navy, it's really a whole of government act. And Ross is going to go into this a little bit more, but uh, suspension and debarment by the Navy is not just 
uh, prohibiting you from doing business with the Navy, but it prohibits you from entering into contracts with the entire U.S. government, unless there's some exception that uh, may apply. Our office, as mentioned earlier, it's led by the Assistant General Counsel of Acquisition Integrity. And generally that position is appointed as the suspending and debarring official. And it's commonly known as the SDO. So next slide, slide nine. Coordination, uh, that's what our office does. So you may, have, you may have heard in the news, you'll see what well, the DOJ has brought an indictment. The DOJ has brought a conviction, right? Well, yes, definitely. And our office plays a role in that. And so we coordinate criminal investigations. We coordinate with the Department of Justice. We receive command referrals. Uh, we receive any type of termination for defaults and care notices. So all of the all of the things that maybe aren't going so well with the contracts, our office is notified of that. We receive mandatory and voluntary disclosure. So if there's some type of act within your company that maybe isn't lawful, you have that duty to disclose that and we will receive those. And we receive those IG complaints and reports and audit referrals. So next slide, slide 10. Administrative actions, right? A lot of us have heard what criminal and civil actions, but administrative actions may be something different. And it is, it's not a criminal or civil action. It's, it's a, something different. And in this case, suspension debarment is prohibiting you from doing business with the government. And at the very heart of it, government contracting, it's, it's not a right, it's, it's a benefit. It's a benefit to do business with the government. Just like you have the right to do business with other private third parties, the government has the right to do or not to do business with you. And so that's why you want to be a responsible party because the government may decide not to do business with you. And in many cases for suspension and department, that is government-wide, not just with the Navy. But sometimes, sometimes, right, that is quite a significant act to take. So the government may want to continue doing business with you, even if you have made mistakes in the past. We're gonna get into that a little bit more. They may enter into something known as an uh, administrative agreement, or they may do something less. They may send a letter of concern, trying to figure out exactly uh, what is going on if there is some reports of potential wrongdoing. Okay, next slide, slide 11. Present responsibility, that's really, the word, I guess, if you're going to remember anything, that would be the word I would hope that you would remember. And that's present responsibility. And yes, you look into the FAR, you look into the definitions, you're probably saying, you know, I've never seen that word defined. What does that mean? Well, it's not defined by the FAR. You're not going to find that definition. But I'll paraphrase for you what the courts have said. And what they've essentially said is, can we, the government, trust to do business with you? Are you a trustworthy party. And that, for a lot of people who are new to government contracting, that can get confusing because, you, as you know, you have that responsibility determination by contracting officers. That's different. That's for a specific contract. This is more of a holistic view. But present responsibility to me, I really enjoy this term because it means, are you trustworthy today? And yes, there are some bad things that happen in companies. There are some bad actors. But under the FAR, you can take those remedial measures. You can make your company better. And you can make yourself presently responsible. And that's one of the reasons why I really do love that term. The S&D process, we talked a little bit about this earlier, right? It's not a right to do business with the government. It's a benefit. Just as you can choose to do business with other people or not to do business with other people, so can the government. So the, the suspension department process, it protects us, the federal government, from fraud, waste, or abuse, right? And this is one of the tools that we can do that. So if we find, if the SDO finds, who's the decision official finds, that you're not a responsible contractor, well, they can impose a suspension or department and stop doing business with you. So suspensions, proposals for department departments, those are probably, if you've ever heard of this, the most widely known tools that are used. And a lot of this, if you are suspended, debarred, it's public knowledge. It's posted on SAM.gov. So if you 
if you are suspended, if you are debarred because of some type of misconduct, uh, at least a portion of that will be publicly uh, posted on SAM.gov. However, not every act, not every misconduct, people make mistakes in life, right? Individuals do, companies do. And that doesn't mean we don't want to do business with you. I, I would say that's quite the opposite. We want to do business with you. The government wants good contractors. We want responsible parties. We want you to give value to the government and the government can pay you and add value to your company. We want you to grow from a small medium and one day potentially even a large business. But many of you being a small business are at the start of that journey. So there's times that the government will not suspend you. There's times the government will not debar you and they will send you some type of letter, a show cause letter, a letter of concern. And essentially what that letter is is saying, look, we've, we've had some We've been notified that there potentially could be some things that are not in line with the terms and conditions or the T's and C's of the contract, right? Or there's some type of criminal activity and we'd like to learn more. Uh, I, as Ross mentioned, it's highly recommended that you engage with our office so we can help determine exactly what is going on and what is uh, potentially can be fixed and, re and take remedial measures so you can be presently responsible. And the last thing for this slide, and Ross is going to get into much more detail than this, but administrative agreements. So a lot of you have never heard of what an administrative agreement is, but what it is, it's an agreement or document where there's some type of remedial measure taken, right, to prevent the reoccurrence of the misconduct in question. And in many cases, right, there's going to be some type of independent person, review, auditor, consultant that's going to be appointed to kind of monitor what's going on to make sure that those remedial measures are implemented and are followed. And, and generally, the term that we use is independent monitor. So next slide, slide 12. So now that you have a better mission of what we do, Ross and myself are going to take a minute to kind of discuss what suspension and debarment is more specifically. So slide 13. And you'll see here on the left, you'll see suspension and on the right, you'll see debarment. And as a, as a lawyer, I always know when I see different sections of the statute, such as FAR 9.407 for suspension or FAR 9.406 for debarment, that in general, there's gonna be some type of differing standard and there is, right? So suspension generally means that there's some type of immediate need that the government has to take to protect itself. Immediate. Immediate is one of those terms that, again, is not defined by the FAR, but I'll tell you what the courts have said. What immediate is not is immediate does not mean that within the next 24 hours, the government must take some type of action. That's not immediate. Immediate is more pressing to say that the government needs to take an action. Uh, in general, because of that kind of, you know, emergency action, if you will, it's a temporary measure. Generally, it's a 12 month limit, but in many cases, it can be extended. And in general, it's used in connection with some type of investigation or legal proceeding. I think the most common type would be an indictment. A debarment's a little bit different. A debarment is more permanent. It's generally for a specified period of time. And in, a good example, I think, would be a criminal conviction. If you're convicted criminally, there's a, there's a chance that that conviction could be used to support a debarment. So even though suspension and debarment are different, they can be used kind of in a same process, right? So if you're looking at something criminal, uh, you may have an indictment early on, the government may decide to take a suspension action. It goes to court, goes to some type of judgment, and they do convict. And then you'll see the department for potentially, you know, some type of period of time. So who can be suspended or debarred? You know, I, I absolutely enjoyed my time in the corporate life. I enjoyed setting up corporate structures for some of the largest companies in the entire world, uh, not just the US, but the world. And you do that for a number of reasons, tax reasons, you do it for liability reasons, but the FAR is kind of unique. And this is something that I do enjoy about the FAR, and Ross is gonna talk about this a little bit more. The FAR can, you can be suspended or debarred as a company, but also as an individual. So a lot of those corporate protections that you set up within your corporate structure to protect yourself individually from liability, well, they may not apply under the FAR because you individually can be 
uh, suspended order bar. So let's go into that a little bit more. What does that mean that a contractor is any individual or organization? Well, first, directly or indirectly, if you submit an offer or awarded or reasonably may be expected to submit an offer or awarded a government contract, you could fall under this. And as a lawyer, the term that I always love is the term or. It's my absolute favorite word. Or reasonably may be expected to submit offers or awards. If that's not a broad term, I don't know what is. So you don't even have to have a current contract with the government. You just may reasonably may be expected to submit even an offer and you could be suspended or debarred. So that's pretty broad. Secondly, conducts business. And here we go again, or reasonably be expected to conduct business with the government as an agent or representative of another contractor. Naras is going to go into that a little bit more. He has some good examples about that, among what that means. Um, and, but in general, what does that mean? Right. What does that mean, John? You said a lot of legal stuff. What does that mean for me? Well, if you're directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly involved in the wrongdoing, you could be uh, suspended and debarred. And so Slide 14, next slide. This is going to be my last slide, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Ross. Now, we covered a lot of the stuff that's on this slide, and we've covered a lot of information. But we talked about earlier about how it's a whole of government, and the government coordinates, right? We coordinate with the DOJ. We coordinate with investigative agencies like NCIS. And but what does that mean? Like, what does that mean? Well, the legal term for that is parallel proceedings, parallel proceedings. And what does that mean? Well, what it means is that there's a simultaneous or successive investigation or litigation or some type of legal proceeding. It can be criminal, it can be civil, it can be administrative, and it's commenced by different agencies, different branches of the government or private litigants out of a common set of facts. So what that means is one, one wrongdoing, right? You could have a criminal action by DOJ, you could have a civil action by the SEC, and you could have a suspension debarment action from the Department of Navy. So I guess a piece of advice would be don't do anything bad because you're gonna have a whole lot of uh, government agencies asking you questions. So as we talked about earlier, in many cases, a suspension will become a debarment. And that perfect example is an indictment for a criminal offense that leads to a conviction. The last thing I'm going to talk about is, okay, John, we, I get it. There's a lot of things that are bad. You know, doing business with the government is a benefit. It's not a right. I need to be presently responsible. But if I do make a mistake and I report it, I can't take remedial measures and be responsible, continue to do business with the government. Absolutely. So what are some causes, though, for suppression and debarment? Well, fraud. That's an obvious one. Embezzlement, theft, forgery, bribery. And one of my, I think one of my favorites is the falsification of records. So when you make, when you fill out all of those forms that you contracting with the government, they need to be accurate. And if you do say something that's a falsification, you could open the door to a suspension and debarment proceeding. False statements, that kind of goes along the lines of falsification of records, tax evasion, violating federal criminal laws. So essentially any federal law, whether it's within the FAR or outside the FAR uh, could lead to a suspension and debarment proceeding. And Ross is going to talk about this a little bit more, but unfair trade practices or AKA antitrust, right? Uh, if there's some type of contractual wronging, right? You're willfully, or you have a history of failure to perform under a, a multitude or even one contract that could lead to a suspension and debarment. Um, if you, knowingly fail to disclose a criminal violation, right? Most co government contracts have within the terms and conditions or the T's and C's that if there's a criminal violation, you need to report that to the government. So if you don't report it, that in itself could be a violation. And then any other cause that affects your present responsibility, that's a catch-all and it's very broad and it's meant to be. So with that, Ross is gonna talk to you about the effects of an exclusion. Ross?
So Ross, I'm going to turn it over to you for the next slide. Can you hear us? Go ahead, Ross. Um, go ahead, Ross, and it's over to you for the next slide. Sorry, I, I I'm hearing John's audio kind of delayed. <laughs> so I'm still I'm still hearing John talking. Um, I think that might be on my end. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going, even though on my end, it sounds like I'm talking over John, but I think he's done and I'm just, uh, it's just coming to me now. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna move to the next, okay. So what are the effects of an exclusion? Um, exclusion applies government-wide. It, it's not just so part of the Navy debarred you. It, it's not just a, you know, you're debarred from part of Navy contract you're debarred from contracts across the federal government. It does not apply to your existing contracts. You can still complete those existing contracts, although the contracting officer can make a determination saying we're gonna you know, terminate this for convenience or terminate for a cause or you know, their determination. Um, but it does apply to any new awards, uh, any subcontracts over $35,000. And it also applies to any new IDIQ contracts, exercise of options, extension, Basically, any new work uh, you're prohibited from from any changes to your contract. Um, and it also extends to non procurement programs, including grants, SBA loans, mortgages, student loans, etc. Now, the, and these are listed on SAM. Um, contracting officers are required to check SAM before they make the award. Um, that's how I know that you are editor to bar. So affiliation, and, and I'm going to talk next about affiliation and imputation. Um, these two concepts, I like to call them the suspension and debarment superpowers. They're really unique to suspension and debarment. And basically what affiliation says is that, you know, if, if the STO has cause to suspend a person or, or a company or debar a person or a company, they can also take action and extend that to any other companies or that that company controls or that that individual controls. So only proof that I need to suspend you based on affiliation is you, know, you are controlled by someone who we have suspended or debarred. And that's really, unique. you can't just say, oh, well, you own this, you know, I've convicted you criminally, so I'm going to convict these companies that you own as well. It's really only in the suspension department context you can do this. And the idea is that, you know, we want to protect, holistically protect the government. We want to keep you from shifting the work from one company to another company and just saying, okay, well, I'll just get these contracts through this other company that I control. Imputation is a little different. Imputation has to do with the misconduct itself. And here under imputation, it, it's about mostly about shifting from employees to companies and companies to employees or, or officials within the company. So if the big thing here to know is that if one of your employees commits misconduct that is debarable, we can debar them as an individual. And then we can, if they were acting on behalf of the company when they engaged in the misconduct, or if the company knew, approved, or acquiesced in the misconduct, then we can impute that misconduct to your company. Um, and here, you know, if, it, if they're acting on behalf of the company, you don't, it could be without your knowledge, you could have nothing to do with it, but nevertheless, your company is, has this misconduct imputed to them. Um, and the idea being here that, you know, you should have in place controls, you should have in place, uh, you know, policies to stop misconduct at your company. Um, so we hold the, the company responsible for the actions of the employees. Uh, it, it also goes the other way around. If let's say the company is, your company is indicted for some criminal conduct um, and you participated in, knew of, or had reason to know of that misconduct, then we can impute that to you as an individual and then 
take a suspension or a debarment action against you on the basis of the company's misconduct. Um, and the same goes for joint ventures. If you've got two joint ventures, one joint venturer engages in misconduct, the other joint venture didn't have, you know, didn't engage in the misconduct, but knew that it was going on, participated in, approved of, acquiesced in that misconduct, then we can impute it between the two companies. So as John mentioned, a letter of concern, this is where, you know, if you, the letter of concern is where the debarring official or show cause letter is where the debarring official is sending you a letter saying, hey, I have concerns about your company. I have determined that I'm not gonna issue a notice of proposed debarment yet. I wanna give you an opportunity to tell me why you're presently responsible before I take that action. Um, you know, the letter of concern is typically more a, you know, I have these concerns. I wanna give you an opportunity to, to come talk to me. The show cause letter basically says, I'm going to debar you unless you give me a good reason not to. It's a little more strongly worded. Um, and, and what I would recommend is if you ever receive one of these letters that you take it very seriously because it means that, that you are uh, very likely to receive a notice of proposed department, receive a suspension notice and, and be excluded. Administrative agreements. So if an administrative agreement is where the debarring official, typically it, it, this is a company that we say, okay, you've had misconduct at your company, you know, you should have had in place better controls, but, but we've already, you're already taking steps to, to address it. You've, you've started down the road towards demonstrating your present responsibility. You're not quite at the point yet where we can just say, okay, you're presently responsible. We can, we can let you off the hook. So what we'll, what the SDO will do is say, look, I'll enter an agreement with you. You're going to continue to develop your ethics and business compliance programs. You're going to probably do some additional programs, uh, audits. You know, you're going to have an independent monitor, which, by the way, you are going to have to go out and hire, who's going to report to us and, and tell us, yes, they're doing everything that, that they agreed to do under this agreement. Um, we might have a site visit. We might come visit your facility to make sure that, that everything is, is uh, up to snuff. Um, and you know, it's it's an opportunity for you not to to avoid uh, being debarred, being suspended, but it is not. It comes at a high cost um, because you know all of those programs you're going to have to implement. You're going to hire new employees. You're going to have to pay for an independent monitor. Um, it's it's not cheap. So you know, the better course of action is have those compliance programs in place in the first place uh, before the SDO comes and tells you you have to do it. Um, and then you avoid uh, having to, to take on these burdens um, and, and have the independent monitor and, and all the other expenses. So uh, next topic we're gonna talk about, and this is really, I think the, the, the big part of this presentation is what are the big, the small business fraud risks that you should be aware of? That, what are the things that we see from our vantage point most often? Um, actually, before I go to that, let me ask, are there any questions in the Q&A uh, that we can address? I think now would be a good time to sort of hit the pause button if there are any. No questions, Ross. You can keep okay. going. Okay, great. Thank you, Arvis. So, okay, what are the, the big small business fraud risks? So first, um, before I get to that, let's talk about, well, what is fraud? Um, you know, we're lawyers, we like to define things. So, you know, here we've got two fraud, uh, two sort of legal definitions of fraud. Um, but really, I, I like to say, you know, fraud, it comes down, it's lying, cheating, and stealing. Um, <laughs> you know, it's all the things that you learn not to do in kindergarten. Um, you know, don't, don't lie to the government. Don't cheat, try to cheat the government. Uh, don't try to steal from the government. Uh, those are the big ones. And, you know, this is not a new problem. You know, there's no kind of dishonesty into which otherwise good people more easily and frequently fall than that of defrauding the government. This was uh, stated by Benjamin Franklin in 1767, before there was even a United States government to defraud. He was actually talking about the King of England. Um, <laughs> but it's not, so this has been around for a long time, I think, in part because, you know, people... The government is this big, huge entity. People don't feel the same sense of, you know, you wouldn't go and steal from your neighbor, but you feel like, ah, if I rob the government a little bit, maybe I don't feel as, as morally uh, culpable for that. Um, but the problem is that, you know, 
fast forward to the 21st century, um, it's a huge liability. It's a huge problem for the Department of the Navy. Um, conservative estimate based on figures from fiscal year 20 is that the, the, the Don loses about $7.5 billion each year uh, due to fraud from, from contract fraud, waste and abuse. Um, we at AIO are able to cover about a dollar for every 60 of that. Um, but you know, a lot, most of that is, is lost. And it's, and the, the cost of fraud also is not just about money. It's also safety. You know, if you're providing parts that go into an F-18 and, you know, they don't meet the mil spec because you lied about the certification and then that part fails, you know, you're talking about loss of life. You're talking, it distracts from the mission. Um, it, it causes significant problems uh, for the Navy completely unrelated to the dollar figure, but the dollars are also significant. So it's, it's a major concern. So we're gonna walk through seven of the uh, largest small business fraud risk examples, things that we think you should be aware of. Um, we'll talk about DBE, pass-through fraud, antitrust, counterfeit goods, bribery and kickbacks, false claims, export control violations, and uh, Procurement Integrity Act violations. So first, let's talk about small business. Let's talk about pass-throughs. Um, so, you know, there are, the government has a number of, of DBE programs to help socially and economically disadvantaged businesses. Uh, for example, you know, you have the SBA 8A Business Development Program. Many of you may be familiar with that program. Um, there's a number of benefits that come with participating in that program, mentorship, assistance, uh, you know, a lot of different benefits, but the big one that, that presents a fraud risk is the set aside and sole source contracts that, that only 8A eligible firms, only DBE certified firms um, are eligible to bid on. Um, so what the, the basic fraud scheme is you have an 8A qualified firm that obtains these set aside awards, but doesn't actually perform the work or doesn't perform the percentage of the work that, that they're required to perform out of the contract. Um, and, and the problem is that this, you know, it, 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 it's the, it uh, obfuscates the whole purpose of the program, which is to help, you know, these 8A firms help the disadvantaged businesses. Um, it's not there to help these non-qualified firms who are out there doing the actual work, taking home most of the profits and using the, you know, the 8A as a pass through. Um, and typically there's some sort of, you know, okay, the 8A gets to retain some portion of the profits in exchange for this arrangement. So this is, it, there's a number of problems here. One, these, these set aside contracts have clauses, you know, subtract, subcontracting limitations that say, look, you cannot subcontract more than 50% of the work. Um, so you have contractual damages there for your violation of the contract terms. Um, also potentially false claims act. We're gonna talk about that a little later when we get to false claims, what, what is the false claims act? But there you're talking about potentially treble damages. So three times whatever the government has lost, it can recover from you um, as a sort of punitive civil award uh, to, to ensure that, that you don't engage in that kind of misconduct again. You're also, if you make any misrepresentations, if you say, yes, okay, the you know, the 8A firm is doing 50% of the work and it's not true, you're looking at false statements, that's criminal. Um, if those, if the 8A firm is retaining, if those fees that they're retaining uh, are, you know, those fees are for participating in an illegal uh, transaction. Um, we're gonna talk more about kickbacks in a little bit, but that that could be a kickback. Um, if, if it's, if you're retaining these funds because, you, you know, someone's paying you to violate your contracts, that's a kickback to the, uh, the subcontract, to the 8A firm. So that's again, potentially criminal liability. And uh, I'm gonna, here's a case, debarment is also a consequence, potential consequence. So this is a case that our, our office took action on. Um, Sage Consulting Group had to pay $4.8 million to settle uh, claims under the Civil False Claims Act and the Anti-Kickback Act. Um, it was exactly this type of scheme I just described. They, you know, had other firms that were 8As that would get the awards and then they would subcontract 100% of the work to Sage. Um, we ended up, uh, Sage, we issued a notice of proposed debarment to Sage. We issued a notice of proposed debarment to the 8As that were working uh, with him in this scheme. 
Um, ultimately, SAGE was debarred. They were able to put forward some evidence that they had implemented remedial measures and that they had taken training in, in ethics and compliance. Um, and so, you know, the standard debarment term is three years. That's kind of the baseline. Um, they got a debarment of 18 months, which, you know, they were lucky that they didn't get a longer term of debarment. They were also lucky that they were not uh, criminally prosecuted and, and only um, civilly uh, prosecuted. So uh, there are other cases where people have gone to jail uh, for these exact same, same, same types of schemes. Okay, next big fraud risk is antitrust. What is antitrust? Uh, it's any sort of conspiracy to engage in anti-competitive uh, practices. Uh, it's pretty broad. Um, but here are some examples of things that will definitely get you in trouble for antitrust. Uh, one, bid suppression. If you are paying someone else not to bid or to withdraw a bid that they have put on a contract so that you will then win that contract, that's an antitrust, a criminal antitrust violation. And you can go to jail for that. Um, complementary bidding and bid rotation, these are kind of, usually these are tied together. Complementary bidding is where you say, okay, well, you're going to, you two are going to bid you, you, you get together with another firm, you say, you guys are both going to bid high, I'll bid low, I'll get the contract. Next time the contract, the next contract that comes around, you'll, you know, I'll bid, you'll bid high and I'll bid, you know, or I'll bid high and you'll bid low and you'll get the contract. And then we can kind of just rotate it and we can make sure we all, it's all evenly spread out. Antitrust violation, you're supposed to be competing for these contract awards, not agreeing on how you're going to manipulate the process to make sure that everybody gets an even number of awards. Um, customer or market allocation, if you're going to your competitor and you're saying, okay, well, you take the people in this zip code, I'll take the people in that zip code. If those people from that zip code come to you, you direct them to me. If people in the other zip code come, you know, you direct them. And that way we can split things out and it can be even. That's a criminal antitrust violation. You can go to jail. Same thing if you say, okay, well, I create widget X and you create widget Y. Why don't we agree that you'll never make you know the widget y and i'll never make the widget x and that way we can both have our little fiefdoms you know where we both have products that we make and we're not competing with each other again criminal antitrust violation you can go to jail for that um, price fixing if you get together with your competitors and you say okay we're going to set the price the price is going to be five dollars um, we will not go below that that's an antitrust violation. You're not supposed to do that. You're not supposed to agree upon prices. Or if you say, oh, we're, you know, we used to give these discounts, but we won't do it anymore if you agree not to do the discount anymore. You're supposed to be competing. You're supposed to be competing with each other. And, and the, the American people are supposed to be getting the best possible price, not for you guys to set prices between you. And then finally, um, no poaching agreements. This is something that we've seen more activity in recently uh, from DOJ. You know, so basically it's just a market allocation agreement for labor. If you go and you say, hey, you know, I won't hire your employees if you don't hire my employees. And if, you know, they call you and say they want an interview, you tell them, no, we're not interested because you worked at X company. And I'll tell them, no, we're not interested because you worked at, you know, and then we'll agree that, that you'll have these employees allocated over here and those employees will be allocated over there. And that way, you know, our labor prices won't go up because they won't be able to compete effectively uh, for jobs at our two companies. That's a potential antitrust violation. Um, and so we, a recent case of this, this is uh, US versus, oh, US versus Mitesh, Mahesh Patel. So actually when I was putting these, we suspended uh, Mr. Patel and several other uh, pretty senior executives at, at large contractors. Um, Mr. Patel was an employee of uh, Pratt and Whitney. Basically, he would he was uh, doing he was this uh, in control of the suppliers, the smaller contractors that were supplying labor. And he said, "Look, I don't want you guys to hire each other's people." Um, they were indicted. We suspended them. Ultimately, this happened after I put my slides together. By the way, they were acquitted uh, very recently of criminal conduct. The judge said, "Look, you know, I this may be." A violation of the law, but I don't think it rises to the level of being criminal. And this is why suspensions are important because, you know, we, the government can protect itself while these things are ongoing. Once the, we're not going to go in, and issue a final debarment for a period of years, though, until we know what the outcome is going to be. Here, the outcome was that they were acquitted. 
So we dropped the suspensions um, so they can, you know, they're no longer suspended. Um, but I'm sure that if they could go back and do it all over again, they would have preferred not to have been investigated and not to have been suspended for the year that they were um, being indicted for this conduct. And, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that they would do things differently. Um, so here's, this is from DOJ. This is some of their red flags for HR people um, that they tell you that you should be on the lookout for. I pulled this from their website. So, you know, don't agree with companies on how, what salaries you're going to pay people. Don't agree to refuse to hire other companies' employees. Don't agree about benefits. Don't agree about other terms of employment. Don't say, well, hey, we're not going to aggressively go after your people. Don't exchange company information. And if you're in a meeting, if you're at a conference and people start having these conversations about, oh, well, maybe we could have some sort of arrangement, get out of there. Because if you're sitting at the table when those conversations are happening, you're likely going to be under investigation if, if the you know DOJ or NCIS gets wind of it uh, through somebody. Um, and it's better to be able to say, no, as soon as those conversations started, I left the room. Next fraud risk, counterfeit parts. Um, a counterfeit part is an unauthorized copy, imitation, substitute, or modified component that is represented as being legitimate. And we mostly see this in the electronics realm where there's lots and lots of counterfeit electro electronic parts mostly coming out of China. Um, there was a Senate Armed Services Committee meeting 2011 uh, quote here, experts have estimated that as many as 15% of all spare and replacement parts purchased by the Pentagon are counterfeit. That's incredible um, to, to hear that. Um, the big thing here is you have to be very careful, particularly I'm telling you in the electronics realm, if you are supplying electronics equipment, uh, networking equipment to the government, it's very, it's often hard to, for us to distinguish between who is the victim, a sort of fellow victim of the counterfeiting and who is the perpetrator. Um, you know, if you provide, because most of these parts are not where, you know, the counterfeit parts are coming through second, you know, third party suppliers and, you know, their, their replacement for, you know, older out of service parts that we can't get directly from the, you know, the original manufacturer anymore. And we are, you know, so if you are the person who buys that part, believing it to be legitimate, you then provide it to the Navy, it turns out to be counterfeit. You're likely to get a call from NCIS. They're going to want to know information about where this part came from. Make sure you maintain that documentation, have records to say, hey, this is where we got this part from. This is, you know, here's, here's what we paid for it. Here's what we did in terms of due diligence to make sure that this part was legitimate and so that you can show that, hey, we were a victim here too and not a participant, not someone who was in on the scheme um, in terms of these counterfeit parts. So this is a recent case. We took a, uh, we suspended Mr. Onor Aksoy. He was running an enterprise, estimated a billion dollars, a billion with a B dollars of fraudulent and counterfeit Cisco networking equipment, specifically Cisco equipment. Um, you know, he was bringing in these counterfeit devices from China. He had like 19 different companies that he was running and all these different Amazon and eBay storefronts where he was selling this equipment as legitimate, brand new Cisco equipment. And lots of companies bought it. Lots of companies sold it onto the government. Some of them probably, some of them believed it was not counterfeit. Maybe some of them knew it was not counterfeit. And so, but it's hard for us to know when we're investigating, you know, who were the people who were, who thought it was legitimate and who were the people who knew it wasn't legitimate and then sold it onto the government. So just keep your records, be very careful um, in, if you're working in these areas. All right, kickbacks and bribery. You know, a kickback is anything basically of value that a subcontractor is giving to a prime contractor or a prime contractor is giving to a subcontractor to get any sort of favorable treatment in connection with the award of subcontracts and, and uh, prime contracts. Uh, and then bribes, a bribe is basically anything of value that you're offering to a public official with the intent to influence them uh, to make any sort of official decision, whether it's, you know, a contract award or, or anything, or to engage in some sort of fraudulent conduct that 
it's going to benefit you. Um, so an example of this, I had a case, uh, you know, the prime, prime contractor would go to the sub and say, hey, you're or a prime contractor employee. So this could be one of your employees going to the sub and says, hey, you know, you put in this bid, you could put in a higher bid. Um, and the sub says, really? Oh, OK, cool. And puts in the higher bid. And then the prime employee says, oh, by the way, you know, I just made you 10 grand. Uh, I'd like you to buy me a car or I'd like you to buy me some iPhones. Um, and, and that's how the scheme work. And then the subcontractor at that point says, oh, geez, I better do what he says or I'm, you know, I'm going to get reported. Um, another example, here's a case that we, we took action on. This was a company, uh, this individual, Mr. Mitchell, had an agreement with one of the subcontractors under his Navy contracts where, you know, he was paying him for doing work on the contract, which he billed to the government, which actually was renovating his, uh, you know, personal vacation home, you know, redoing his kitchen, uh, paying for a boat, paying for personal vacations. Um, this individual and the subcontractor uh, were both debarred. And also the example I gave earlier, that, was the, that individual was also debarred. Um, all right, false claims. So the, what is the, the False Claims Act? You probably heard this talked about before. Um, also called the Lincoln Law, goes back all the way to the Civil War, um, and it imposes liability on persons and companies who defraud government programs. And it's the primary litigation tool for the government for combating fraud against the government. Um, two essential elements of the False Claims Act. One, treble damages. If you are violate the False Claims Act, they bring a civil case against you. The government can recover three times whatever its losses were um, under the based on that false claim. Um, second is key tam lawsuits. So a key tam lawsuit is where you have a relator, this individual who brings forward, blows the whistle, brings forward the misconduct. Usually it's an employee at a company says, hey, my company's engaged in fraud and they can bring a lawsuit in federal court on behalf of the government. Um, the complaint is filed under seal. So no one can, can know that there's been a complaint filed. Um, the government then has an opportunity to go investigate, figure out, hey, is this legitimate? Is this person, are these real claims? Did this actually happen? Um, the government can then choose, hey, do we want to intervene? And do we want to sort of represent ourselves in this suit um, and have DOJ come in with their lawyers? Or do we not want to intervene? And in which case, then the relator can say, OK, either I'm going to move forward with this case and continue to pursue it, or they can, you know, say, OK, well, if the government's not going to intervene, I'm going to go ahead and voluntarily dismiss. Um, if the lawsuit is successful, the relator gets a share of the money that's owed to the government based upon the false claim. And usually that's 15 to 25 percent can be a very, very large amount of money um, for that relator if, if, it, if there's a very, very large fraud against the government. So yeah, in a false claim, we're talking about demand or money or property that is based on a material falsehood. And some examples, cost mischarging. If you're charging the government for costs under your contract that you didn't actually incur, knowingly doing that, um, that's gonna come under the False Claims Act. Possibly also false statements, uh, criminal liability. Labor hour mischarging. You build the government for hours that you claimed you worked, but you didn't work. Um, and remember too, if this is your employee doing this, this is potentially imputable to you. If they did this as part of their duties, it can be potentially imputed to your company. Um, false testing data, false certifications, and false pricing information, also under the Truth and Negotiations Act, that is that is another uh, potential liability if you're lying about your pricing information. Bradkin, this, is a, this was a huge False Claims Act case. Um, Elaine Thomas was the chief metallurgist at Bradkin. She has she had been at the company for over 40 years. She was everyone trusted her. Everyone thought she is the she knows she was on the lecture circuit talking about metallurgy. Everybody thought Elaine absolutely knows what she's talking about, knows what she's doing. Um, turns out she had been falsifying uh, the results of testing for over 30 years. Um, for parts that were going on to Navy nuclear submarines. Um, and this had to do with steel components that were essential to the structure of the, uh, of the submarine. 
uh, it was a crime inspired by hubris, not by greed. Um, she didn't gain anything from her, her, her fraud. Um, she basically just thought she knew better than the Navy about what the testing standards should be. Um, they had requested that she test the steel at negative 100 degrees. Um, she thought that that was, was, she said, stupid and unnecessary was, was her quote. Um, and she just fabricated the results to say that the, the parts had passed that test because she didn't think that they should have to undergo that test. Um, she, as you will see, you know, the company had to pay $10.8 million. The company is now also under an administrative agreement with the Department of the Navy. So they've got an independent monitor. They've got, you know, uh, all types of compliance programs that they're having to implement to make sure this type of thing doesn't happen again. She went to jail. She served 32, uh, or excuse me, she served uh, 30 months in prison um, for her misconduct and also paid substantial fines. Export control violations. So ITAR is a regulation, international traffic and arms regulation, controls the import export of defense goods uh, and data as defined in the United States munitions list. Um, the definition of what is technical data is very broad. So it includes design, manufacture, testing, repair, and quality assurance for any defense articles. And so what, what it says is you are prohibited from transferring or disclosing this technical data to foreign persons, even in the United States, unless you have a proper license uh, from the Department of State. And the export administration regulations is similar, but it covers dual use commodities, things that have both a military and a, uh, a non-military purpose, such as software and technologies. Um, but it's, just some, it's very similar in terms of what it restricts. Um, the thing to know about, about the ITAR is that if you are involved in, in if you're working with these, ITAR regulated technical data, it's really advised that you should bring in a professional consultant who works on ITAR issues to help you develop the kinds of controls, a consultant, someone who understands ITAR and, uh, and, and know also that, you know, you, while you may have employees that have green cards, they're still not U.S. citizens. So they're still going to fall under that restriction uh, for non-U.S. citizens. Uh, viewing the information. So really, if you're if you're dealing with this, you, you it is really advised that you bring in someone who's a professional to look at your, what you're doing and, and tell you, you know, how to make develop a program to ensure that these uh, drawings are protected. And even the big guys uh, get in trouble with this. Honeywell uh, paid 2021 paid 13 million dollars to settle alleged violations of the uh, of ITAR, um, you know, they had a whole system in place in terms of, of uh, how to, you know, to protect these drawings to make sure that they didn't end up going to overseas. And nevertheless, uh, their employees circumvented those systems and, and, and were sending uh, drawings to, to China and Taiwan and Ireland and other countries uh, where they were viewed by non-US citizens. Procurement Integrity Act uh, prohibits the release of source selection and contractor bid or proposal information. Uh, specifically, it says no one shall uh, obtain such information before the award of a contract to which the information relates. Um, and there are also some restrictions there on government employees. If you're hiring government employees, there are restrictions on the types of work they can do and, and you know, uh, having com uh, conflicts of interest potentially with information they learned. Uh, while working for the government. Um, the bottom line here with the Procurement Integrity Act is be very careful if you decide to hire someone who's a former government employee. Um, again, you probably want to have counsel, have a you know consultant, somebody look at that hiring um, because if ultimately it turns out that that individual who's coming over the government uses information that they learned while in the government that is source selection or contractor bid proposal information that, you know, that they're not supposed to be using, you know, things like your competitor's pricing information, and they're using that in there to, you know, advance your interests, your company's interests. Um, if, if NCIS get the wind of it, you're going to be, the assumption will be that that was the reason you hired them, um, that you wanted to get the information that they had, um, and that, you know, and that you were involved in, in getting that source selection information, you're gonna, and you will likely find yourself 
uh, the subject of a criminal investigation. So make sure when you're hiring those employees that they get their PGE letters, their post-government employment letters, make sure that there's been a conflicts check to make sure that they're not going to be, you know, working on anything that, that they would be able to use any source selection information um, inappropriately, because it can result in criminal investigation. It can also result in, um, you know, a, a uh, protest that could result in you getting kicked off uh, the contract. And here you had a case uh, in Louisiana, a company, one of their employees was conspiring with a government employee to get source selection information. Um, you know, uh, they ended up paying a $500,000 uh, penalty um, at probation of five years, um, and they were convicted uh, for violations of the Procurement uh, Integrity Act. So last, I'm just gonna very briefly give a, a quick overview of what you can do at your company to, to try to control these fraud risks. Um, so first, put in place controls. Uh, create policies and procedures to limit your fraud risks. Avoid single points of failure. So, you know, the person who approves the purchase should not be the person who signs the check. Uh, think of the Elaine Thomas situation at Bradkin. You know, that person at your company who never takes a vacation, nobody really understands how she does what she does, but she's got control over a lot of funding and really important decisions. Um, you know, don't, you should be cautious, wary of that person and, and try to say, hey, why don't we get somebody else in here to help you and, and who can, you can teach how you do what you do. Um, so that, you know, the because if you don't understand what that person's doing, they could be engaging in fraud and you would not learn about it for 30 years, uh, much like the Bracken situation. And then, you know, encourage people to report misconduct through clear reporting and investigation policies. You know, if you can afford it, get a hotline, get an anonymous hotline service so that people can report uh, misconduct that way and have a clear zero tolerance, no retaliation policy. If somebody works forward misconduct, we will not retaliate, you know, against that person uh, for bringing forward uh, misconduct. And that way people will actually come to you and say, hey, you know, I've learned about this thing and you can you can deal with it. Um, you, you can, you know, start putting in place uh, things to make sure that it doesn't happen again. And then you can come talk to the SDO and say, hey, look, this is what we've done for a presently responsible company. When you're putting in place these policy and procedures, think about the fraud triangle, which is, you know, this is a, a social psychologists have come up with this framework of why people engage in fraud. Um, you know, people engage in fraud when there's three, three things in place, three elements. One, opportunity. They think they're going to get away with it. They think no one will catch them. They think that no one's looking. They think that no one knows how they do what they do and that, you know, that, that it's never going to be discovered. Pressure. Um, people will commit fraud if they think they're under pressure. If they think, you know, they're trying to get a promotion, an award, win a contract, not get fired, might, you know, can be professional, like, like those examples are gonna be personal, they're caring for a sick loved one, maybe they're having an affair and they need a source of income that their spouse won't know about. Um, that's, you know, all of these are reasons why people feel pressured uh, to engage in fraud. And then finally, rationalization. They're able to, to wrap their head around it and say, you know, this really isn't so bad, I deserve this money, I should have gotten that raise or that award. You know, I'm not actually hurting anybody. Uh, we hear this from contractors all the time. You know, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I did the work for the government. The government wasn't out. I just, the way I got the contract was fraudulent. I should have gotten, shouldn't have gotten the contract and I made misrepresentations. Well, that's still fraud and the government would not have made that award to you. Um, so it's not, no one's hurt the taxpayer's heart because they paid more than they should have uh, on that contract. Or, you know, you hear people say, well, I thought everyone else was doing it. I thought if I didn't do it, I'd be a sucker. I'd be missing out on an opportunity. Um, so, you know, you avoid these things, one, by putting in place the policies and procedures. So people say, hey, there's not an opportunity, you know, looking into where are people feeling pressured, where are people potentially rationalizing. And then finally, the other big thing is culture. You have to create a culture where it encourages ethical conduct. You have to, you know, have that tone at the top. Uh, saying, look, we're an ethical company, we do things the right way, the mood in the middle that has to be then communicated down to your mid-level managers, and then finally, you know, you're the, the, the buzz at the bottom. Maybe these are more applicable in the big organizations than in the small companies, but you can still, you know, scale this down 
and say, look, we keep telling our employees that we need to be ethical, we need to do the right thing. You've got to follow, when you put in place those priorities and procedures, you got to follow them and you got to make sure your employees are following them. And you got to encourage them to report the red flags. You know, when you see something, say something. Um, the culture piece is really essential. Um, and, and you people, you know, you lead by example. Uh, if people see you as leaders doing the right thing, um, they will too. Finally, if you do uncover fraud at your company or that there's been some sort of fraud, you have a duty to disclose it to the government. Um, you have a duty to have in place, you know, uh, programs to prevent and detect criminal conduct. You have a duty to promote an organizational culture, like I just talked about, um, that you know encourages ethical conduct. And then, if you discover that there's any uh, fraud in relation to an award performance, close out of a contract, or any subcontract under there, or any credible evidence of fraud involving a principal, a employee, agent, or subcontractor of you know of your company, you have an obligation to report that to the DODIG. Um, and frankly, if you're going to report it, if you report it to DODIG, those referrals, those mandatory disclosures will come to our office. So my advice would be you might as well come and talk to us as well when you make those disclosures, um, because we're going to learn about it eventually. All right. That's uh, if you suspect it again, if you suspect acquisition fraud, contact DODIG, your contracting officer. Uh, any the DOD Don hotline for your particular command that you're working with. And there's our contact information for AIO um, if you want to come and talk about you know, what you're doing to address the fraud um, with the SDO. And with that, uh, we'll open it up for questions. I think we're a little over time. I don't know if we have time for any, uh, any questions, but uh, are there any in the Q&A? Oh, so what we will do, so thank you first uh, to Ross and John for taking time out of their schedule to join us today. Um, we do have a few questions. What we will do is uh, collect those questions, get them over to you, and we will post them along with the slides on our website. So thank you so much Wonderful. for joining us, everyone, in this insightful presentation. And Please join us at Gold Coast because uh, you will be joining us at Gold Coast to have a breakout session. So if you're planning on it, joining us uh, in San Diego in the July timeframe uh, at the Don Small Business Procurement event, uh, you will see these lovely two gentlemen there. So thank you very much, everyone. Stay safe. Have a good one. Thank you so much.